All right, I think that covers it. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 8. Uh, we are, last week we did something different. We had a Q&A time. Did you like that? That, that, that Q&A question and answer thing? Uh, and that seemed to, to, to work. Um, I wasn't sure. I was sure of myself. I wasn't sure about Paul. I didn't know how he'd handle it, but he did okay. Don't you think he did okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, I love that man. Um, and uh, I, we'll probably be doing more of that. It seemed like it really hit a chord. And um, so that'll be coming up in the, in the future sometime. But now we're getting back to the text. We're going through the book of Luke. That's what we do here. Nothing fancy. We just study the Bible. And so now we're up to Luke chapter 8. I want to entitle this message, The Anti-Inside-Outside Kingdom. The Anti-Inside-Outside Kingdom. And hopefully you'll know why I call it that here in a little bit. Uh, we, two weeks ago, looked at Jesus uh, casting the demons out of the man in the land of the Gerasenes. We saw that that was a Gentile region, and that's why the people uh, thought Jesus was a sorcerer, which is why they were afraid of him and wanted him to leave. That's why they were raising pigs. You'd never find that on, in, a Gentile, in a Jewish area, because that was forbidden by the law in the Old Testament. But that was a Gentile region, so they're raising pigs, and the pigs got demonized and committed suicide, and it was a bizarre thing. We talked about that two weeks ago. Uh, here Jesus is coming back to Jewish soil, uh, Jewish land, and, and the people are seeing them, uh, him not as a sorcerer, but as the Messiah, miracle-working Messiah. And we'll see that everything about this text is distinctly Jewish. Uh, the, the main issue that we'll be examining here has to do with uh, an issue that would never arise on, on Gentile soil. Uh, it's, it's an issue of ritual purity. All right, so let's start with verse 40. I'm reading from the TNIV version. Now, when Jesus returned from where he was in the land of the Gerasenes, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, so he starts heading towards Jairus' house, uh, the crowds almost crushed him. So uh, we've seen throughout the book of Luke that the crowds keep on increasing, and now they're just pressing in on him. Uh, it says that Jairus was a, a leader of the synagogue. Now, that is something sort of equivalent to a, to a pastor today. It was a person in charge of a synagogue, in charge of the reading of the text and the administration of, of various things. And it was a very well-respected uh, position in Jewish culture. And what's significant about that is this. Um, most of the time we've seen throughout the book of Luke, and we'll be seeing it later on, it was the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes who gravitated towards Jesus. And the religious folks tend to not like Jesus very much. But we here see that that wasn't always the case. Uh, some of the high and mighty religious folks of Jesus' day liked Jesus and, and, and to some degree followed him. And it tells us that the kingdom of God is open to everybody, including the high and mighty religious folks. It's just that most of the high and mighty religious folks weren't open to the kingdom. But the kingdom that Jesus is establishing here is an all-inclusive kingdom. It's open to everybody. Moving on. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and no one could heal her. She came up behind Jesus, kind of snuck up, and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Okay, this phrase, subject to bleeding, is sort of just an idiomatic way of referring to uh, what would have been chronic vaginal bleeding. Uh, it wasn't life-threatening for this woman, because she'd had it for 12 years, but it would have been socially devastating. According to the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 15, when a woman was having her menstrual period or bleeding for any other reason, she was considered to be ceremonially or ritualistically unclean. Um, she wasn't allowed to touch anybody during that time. Uh, if she touched anybody, they were considered to be unclean, and they had to do a kind of a ceremonial washing and they weren't allowed to touch anybody until evening time. I have no idea, I have no idea why. Uh, it's, it's just one of those bizarre laws of the Old Testament. I'm sure someone's got to figure it out, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, but So this lady, by virtue of having this issue, uh, would have been untouchable. Literally, she was one of the untouchables. But she goes through the crowd and she touches Jesus. Then Jesus says this, Who touched me? When they all denied it, 
Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. So Peter says, what do you mean who touched you? People have been touching you all over the place. I mean, there's a crowd around you. But Jesus stops and he says, who touched me? And everyone denies it, including this woman who touched him. Um, uh, they, they all lie. So I get this picture of Jesus walking along. People are pressing him. He stops. He turns around and he goes, who touched me? And they all back off and they all go like this. You know, what, what, I, I didn't touch you. I didn't do it. <laughs> Jesus says, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Interesting phrase. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling at his feet and fell at his feet. Now, why was she trembling? The answer is that she just broke an Old Testament law. She just defiled a bunch of people by touching them. She just defiled, made unclean Jesus by touching him. And she just lied about it. So she's in a world of trouble. And so she's scared. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched Jesus and how she had been instantly healed. Then Jesus said to her, daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. The people would have been expecting a Jewish leader to give a strong, strong rebuke at this point. But Jesus instead praises her uh, faith. While Jesus was still speaking, Someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, Your daughter is dead. She just died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And there's a sense of scorn there, I think. Like, don't bother. You, you, the opportunity was missed. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead. She's asleep. Now, what you need to know about this is that Jesus is, is, is speaking a little bit ironically here. Sleep was a metaphor or a euphemism that they had for death in, in first world Judaism. Uh, we, 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 we sometimes say, we usually say someone passed away. It's just a polite way of saying that they died. Well, in the first, in first century Jew, uh, Jewish culture, you'd say they fell asleep. They're, they're sleeping. They said that because most Jews of the time, not all, but most Jews of the time believed that at the end of this epoch, at the end of the age, uh, the Lord was going to raise people from the dead and establish his kingdom on earth. And so they held that people were really just sleeping and waiting, they were waiting to be woken up uh, at the end of the age. What Jesus is really saying here then is this. He, he's saying... Um, us Jews, we always refer to people being asleep. And I want to now show you how true that is. Uh, we believe that there'll be a resurrection at the, end of the, the, at the end of the age when the Lord raises people from the dead. I want to now show you that I am the Lord who raises people from the dead. I am the kingdom that's coming at the end of the age. And so I'm going to wake this girl up ahead of time. But the people don't really get it. Uh, in fact, it says here that they laugh at him knowing that she was dead. This, of course, isn't a laughter of, of uh, you know, funniness. It, it's a laughter that is a mocking kind of a laughter, and it's born out of profound grief. But Jesus took the girl's hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. I, I love those little details like that. She's probably hungry. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. A few little points here. It's interesting that Jesus touched this girl. He had just been defiled by the, the unclean woman touching him, which made him unclean. But now he touches a corpse. And that also was forbidden by Jewish law. So Jesus just defiled himself. But of course the, the corpse uh, comes to life. It's also interesting that here Jesus tells the people, don't go spreading this around. Go to, don't tell anyone about this. In the passage we looked at two weeks ago, Jesus told the man who was delivered of demons, go and tell everybody about this. Now why? And as I said two weeks ago, the, the, the explanation is this. In a, in a Gentile region, in a non-Jewish region, Jesus wanted this man to go and tell everybody that it wasn't through sorcery that these demons were delivered out of this man. It was by God. It was, it was by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he was going to be an evangelist to, to the Gentiles. But in Jewish, in Jewish settings... Uh, Jesus' reputation was already growing very, very fast. 
He needed three years to lay the foundation for the coming kingdom, and so he was concerned about not getting crucified too early. He knew that this would result in his crucifixion, so he's kind of buying time by by reining it in as much as possible. And so usually when on on Jewish soil, he tells people, don't go spreading this around, whereas on Gentile soil, he tells them to go spread it around. I want to delve more deeply into this lady and, and what's going on in her life. But before I do that, let's pray. Lord, our our total trust is in you. Our confidence is not in human wisdom or in human words. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, to take these words and use them to build your kingdom. Lord, uh, use it to collapse all of our religious conditioning that would maybe make it hard to hear this message. Collapse all of our judgment mechanisms. Help us to see the world and to see other people as you see the world and as you see people. And to live out your beautiful, radical kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this lady had this um, chronic vaginal bleeding. and She had it for 12 years. And that made her unclean by Old Testament standards. She wasn't allowed to touch anybody. In fact, she wasn't... Anyone she touched was considered unclean. As I said, they, they had to wash. And they couldn't touch anyone until evening. And anything, anything she touched was considered unclean. If she sat on a chair... Uh, then that chair had to be washed before it could be considered uh, open for for general use. Women, when they were having their menstrual period or any other kind of bleeding, they had to wear a special garment, a special cloth around them to let everyone know that they were unclean. And if they were coming to a crowd, um, they had to, at a certain distance, shout out, I'm unclean! Uh, Because they didn't want anybody to accidentally touch them. It didn't matter whether you touched them on purpose or accidentally, they were considered unclean. So they had to announce this. Women today, you can be very glad you didn't live in Old Testament times. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> imagine what that would be like if you had to wear a special... Uh, uh, no, don't, don't even go there. Uh, <laughs> and then when their time of the month was over, they had to sacrifice two pigeons or two doves, depending on how wealthy they were, Uh, in order to be allowed to now have contact with the rest of the community. This woman had had this condition for 12 years. That means she had had no human contact for 12 years. Never felt the warmth of an embrace for 12 years. Uh, She would have been considered the quintessential outsider. She's outside of Jewish community. She's outside of the Jewish religion. She She is, for all intents and purposes, a leper. Her life would be impoverished. She would have to survive by begging on the streets. Uh, You know, there's, there's, uh, in all probability, she wasn't married. No one would marry a woman with with, with this condition. Uh, Her her life was desperate, and she is an outsider. But she hears Jesus is coming to town. She hears some things that Jesus is doing. And so she, perhaps if she needed to, she disguised herself so people wouldn't recognize her. Or maybe this wasn't her hometown, and so people wouldn't recognize her anyways. But she plows through a thick crowd of people to make her way towards Jesus. She's not wearing her garment, the garment that she's supposed to wear to notify people that she's unclean. She doesn't announce to people that she's unclean. So she's defiling people left and right, making them unclean. She intentionally and covertly disobeys this Old Testament law. She knowingly contaminates, if you will, these other people. She knowingly makes Jesus unclean. And then when she's asked about it, she lies. The crowd would have been shocked at how brazen this was, this Jewish crowd, and they would have been extremely angry with her. They would have been thinking something like, you know, you unclean, selfish, sinful, low-life woman lying woman. There would have been disdain towards her. Now they are all supposed to go home and, and wash themselves to, to, to be cleansed, and they can't touch anyone for the, you know, the, the rest of the day. You know, she just screwed up everyone's day, uh, to say the least. They would have been very angry with her. And then imagine Jairus. His daughter is on her deathbed, on the verge of dying. He goes out of desperation to get Jesus. He's probably trying to hurry this crowd along. Come on, my daughter's dying. Can you come? Can you come? And this woman holds up the whole show to the point where Jesus doesn't get there on time and she dies. What's Jared's going to think about this woman? This woman would at this point be public enemy number one. She was an outsider to start with, but she's even more of an outsider right now. And so the people would have been expecting Jesus to use this as a wonderful opportunity 
to make an example out of her. Here's a time, Jesus, where you can show your belief in the Old Testament and, and your solidarity with the law. And here's a time to make an example uh, of, of, uh, of people like this who, who, who have a disregard for the law. It's time to call down the wrath of God on this woman. They would have been thinking, this woman violated all that is holy. She trampled on all that is good. She showed disdain for all that makes us distinctly Jewish people as opposed to just those heathen that are out there. And so they would have been wanting Jesus to show his solidarity with them by, sharing in their, by entering into solidarity with their disdain for this woman. But Jesus remarkably and shockingly and beautifully doesn't do that. What Jesus does is he actually affirms her action as an expression of faith. Think about that. What faith that would drive you to do that? And then Jesus calls her daughter. Calls her a daughter. Daughter, your faith is. Daughter is a term of, of profound endearment. If there's ever an insider term, it's the term daughter. So here's this woman, she's unclean, she doesn't wear a special garment, she doesn't announce to people that she's unclean, she intentionally defiles people in the crowd, she intentionally defiles Jesus, she lies about it, she holds up the parade and, and causes Jairus' daughter to die, and Jesus calls her a daughter, and Jesus praises her faith. Jesus here is proclaiming the absolute outsider to be an absolute insider, and it's shocking and it's beautiful. Now, the episode raises a lot of questions. Like a lot of passages in the Bible, it raises far more questions than it answers. For example, we don't find Jesus saying anything about how you're supposed to clean up this mess. You've got a crowd of defiled people here. What are you supposed to do about that? Jesus, do you want us to go home and, and wash ourselves like the law requires? Um, Jesus, are you going to go and wash yourself like the law requires? Are you, are you going to not have any contact with any other people until, until evening time like the law requires? Uh, Jesus, tell us where you stand on the Old Testament. It, we don't find that. We, we, we do see that Jesus doesn't go and wash himself. In fact, he, the next thing he does is he defiles himself further by touching a corpse. So Jesus, what is your view of the Old Testament? What is your view of the law? Do you think it's okay for people to just disregard it like this woman did? What's your opinion? It's odd. What makes it really odd is that Jesus clearly believes in the Old Testament, and he clearly holds the law up in great respect. We find Jesus saying things like this. I haven't come to break the law. In fact, I've come to fulfill the law. Not one dot of the law, not one period, not one comma of the law is going to pass away before it's all fulfilled. So he has this deepest respect for the law, and yet here he seems to kind of have a minimal view of it. He, he, he's not worried by the fact that this lady just broke the law and defiled everybody and, and, and that, may, that, that she made him ceremonially unclean. How do you put this together? He, Jesus doesn't tell the woman to go and sacrifice some pigeons. He doesn't tell the crowd to go wash and he himself doesn't go wash. So do you believe in the Old Testament or not? Do you believe in the law or not? It, it's, it's kind of messy and we're not given any answers here. What I do know is that, that Jesus had deep respect for the law. Uh, and yet he didn't, he, he wasn't a legalist about it. See, this is the kind of thing where sometimes you just got to say, I don't know. Uh, sometimes you just got to say, you know what, we're dealing here with a mystery. Maybe Jesus just doesn't fit into all of our categories. Maybe, you know, sometimes you just can't figure Jesus out. Anyone find that? Sometimes you just can't figure God out. Sometimes he's a little bit bigger than our brains. Maybe Susan was right in the Chronicles of Narnia when, he says, when she said that Aslan was an untamed lion. Maybe Jesus is untamed. We just can't get him into our categories. Uh, and this drives people like me who really put a premium on logical consistency. It drives me crazy. Yeah, it's like, I, I don't like to, to, to admit that there's, I don't see any consistency here. Uh, but the good news is this. If Jesus sometimes acted in a confusing way, that means it's got to be okay in the kingdom to sometimes be confused. It's okay to not have it all figured out. It's okay to have unanswered questions. It's okay to, you know, just say, you know, I don't know. That's just an odd thing. But as I said, what I do know is that Jesus had, had the utmost respect for the law as being divinely inspired. But he never put it in front of people. He never, he, he never kept a rule when it was going to uh, in any way uh, oppress a person or keep them from being freed. People come before rules. That's why Jesus fed people on the Sabbath. That's why he healed people on the Sabbath. This woman broke all sorts of rules. But what's important to Jesus is not the fact that she broke the rules. I don't know what his opinion of that would have been. But what's, what's important is that this lady had faith that drove her to do this. 
even though technically she broke the law, but it was her faith that Jesus saw and the fact that this woman had, was now healed. And compared to a woman now being set free and now being welcomed into the community and having this kind of faith, compared to that, well, the fact that she broke some rules doesn't seem to be very important to Jesus Christ. See, this is the kind of behavior that drove the religious authorities crazy. Uh, religious authorities who are very invested in keeping the rules and making sure that we, we Jews don't act like the heathen and we keep those, those things nice and separated, uh, they'll always put rules and the law before people. A legalist will trample on people all over the place uh, in order to keep a rule. Jesus did the opposite. People are more important than rules. The main thing that this story teaches us is that the, the kingdom of God is a kingdom in which the insider-outsider, us-them distinction is being collapsed. It's being obliterated. In the kingdom of God, when God begins to reign, and that's what we're seeing happening here in this, in this episode with Jesus, the whole us-them mindset is starting to be done away with. All those distinctions. And this is huge, folks. This is huge. Because this goes to the core of human, fallen human society. Human society, all human social groups, feed off of and live off of this us-them mindset. The insider-outsider distinction. Who's on the inside and who's on the outside. Some sociologists say that you can't have a social group unless you have some sort of parameter that sets the people on the inside apart from the people on the outside. And yet, this is the very thing that Jesus is collapsing in this episode and in other episodes and in a lot of his teaching. Uh, this is a fundamental aspect of fallen human cultures. We all see it growing up in elementary schools. You've got, you've got groups, right? You've got cliques. There, there's those who are inside the, the popular crowd and those who didn't quite make the cut. And you've got those who are inside the pretty crowd and those who didn't quite make the, cr the cut. And those who are inside the jock crowd, you know, the sports crowd. Uh, and then those who, who weren't good at sports, they didn't make the cut. And you've got those who are in the cool crowd, but those who aren't so cool and they didn't make the cut. All sorts of groups like that. If you go to schools that, that have some diversity, you're going to find other kind of groups because you've got those who are in the white crowd and those who aren't, those who are in the black crowd and those who aren't, those who are in the Latino crowd and those who aren't, those who are in the Asian crowd and those who aren't, all sorts of distinctions. And it, it's rooted in the fallen nature of the world. And we really don't outgrow it, sadly, as adults. We maybe refine it in different ways, dress it up in different ways, but we've got all sorts. We live in an us-them world. It's fallen culture. You got the haves and the have-nots. You got the upper class versus the lower class, the educated versus the uneducated, the winners versus the losers, categories all over the place. And as you have in, in diverse schools, uh, you have in, in, in uh, adult society where there's a race dimension to the whole thing. Yeah. There are those who are inside of the white-dominated social privilege status and those who are not. Those are those who are part of the club and those who are not. And if you're white, it's a lot easier to get in that club than if you're not white. I saw a statistic this last week. 75% of all white people 30 years and older own their own house. Less than 25% of African Americans 30 and older own their own house. Why is that? If you're white, you're three times more likely to own a house than if you're black. Why is that? Uh, is it because African Americans just don't like to own their, own own their own houses? They'd rather pay rent and not have any equity? I don't think so. There's something systemic going on, you see. And it has to do with power structure. Uh, the, the, some are on the inside of that, and some are not. And a full explanation would have to take us all the way back to you know, pre-Civil War days. But the bottom line is that it, it, we, we have a, a culture with a white-dominated power structure to it that privileges some, but not others. It's the kind of thing that I, as a white person, was largely unaware of until the last 10, 15 years when I've developed safe, meaningful relationships with people uh, who, who aren't white, and I get a peekaboo into their world. And what you discover is that there's all sorts of things in the culture that communicate to some but not others that you're, you're welcome and you're not welcome. A lot of them can be very subtle and some of them can be overt. You go to a restaurant, you're African American, you go with seven white friends. The waitress comes and she looks all the other folks in the eye, she smiles at them, she jokes with them, but when she comes to you, she's looking off in the distance in the other direction as she takes, takes your uh, order. And, or maybe, I, I've heard this several times, she, she misses you altogether, just doesn't see you. Uh, ways of communicating that, well, I maybe have to wait on you, you're really not welcome here. Norm tells me about the first time in his marriage, he's married to Di, who was white, and they go to a, uh, an upscale restaurant, and they have a, 
uh, reservation. But they get there, and all of a sudden there's no tables available. And the maitre d' seats seven other couples after him who are white, but there's no tables available for him. And then you voice an objection saying, we had a reservation. And all of a sudden, there's this parent like paranoia, like, why are you raising your voice? You don't need to raise your voice. And he's not raising his voice. But it caused kind of a stir. And then all of a sudden, we're going to have to ask you to leave if you don't, you know, uh, stop making a fuss about things. Wait your turn. Subtle ways that you communicate, you're not really welcome here. Norm tells me about a time he and I went to a, a, a car dealer to buy a car. And, and the salesperson talked to Di, who's white, made eye contact with Di, but never even looked at Norm. Now, usually in car lots, my experience has been that usually the, the, the dealer talks to the guy because he assumes, in a sexist way for sure, that the guys are going to know more about cars than the woman, which in my case is totally not true. Uh, <laughs> but that's what they usually do. But here, here the, you know, and it's a way of saying, uh, I, I, I don't deal with the likes of you. So we, uh, we, there's insiders and outsiders on every level in our society, and it continues to have a, a racial uh, dimension to it. And churches are full of insider-outsider distinctions. Most of them are. You got, you know, in fact, they're built on it. Uh, us versus them. We are the holy versus the unholy. We have the right beliefs versus those who have the wrong beliefs. We have the acceptable imperfections versus those people who have the deal-breaker imperfections. We are the saved. They are the lost. We are the fixers of society. Those people are the breakers of society. We are the guardians of truth and righteousness. They are the enemies of truth and righteousness. Us, them, us, them, inside, outside. It runs throughout fallen society. And here comes Jesus and what he's doing in this passage and in other passages is he's completely collapsing that social game. Amen? All those distinctions are done away with. Jesus is bringing, he, he, he's, he's, through his life and his teachings, uh, proclaiming that he's bringing a new way of doing life, a new way of doing community, a new way of looking at the world. And, and it's called the kingdom of God, the dome in which God reigns. And when God reigns, all of those distinctions that society invests so much with, all those distinctions that people get so much life out of, all those us, them, inside, outside categories are being done away with. They're being abolished. The categories of, of the religious versus the non-religious, the black versus the white, the rich versus the poor, the clean versus the unclean, the male versus the female, the American versus the Palestinian, the political conservative versus the political liberal, the educated versus the uneducated, the capitalist versus the socialist, those who got it together and those who don't got it together, all those kinds of distinctions, all those kinds of categories, all those ways of filing people, all those ways of getting life by contrasting yourself with other people, they're all done away with in the kingdom of God. They're abolished in the kingdom of God. They've been annihilated in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there's no more us, them, clean, unclean, good guy, bad guy, because in the kingdom of God, we all know that we're all equally sinners. And therefore, no one's in a position to be judging another. We all know that we all equally stand by God's grace, so no one's in a position to be excluding anyone. In the kingdom of God, we're to be defined exhaustively by the love of God, which means all the other fallen social ways of defining people are rendered absolutely insignificant. When Jesus comes, if you read this passage carefully, what he's saying here is this. I got a new rule for you. And the rule is this. Anyone who is moving towards me is, on the, is an insider. Anyone who's moving towards me is an insider. I don't care if you broke a ton of rules, even biblical rules, to get to me. You're touching me now, and that makes you an insider. I don't care if the Bible itself says that you are unclean. You're moving towards me, so you're an insider. I don't care if there's a rule that says you're not supposed to touch anybody. You can touch me, and when you do it, you're an insider. I don't care if you're a sinner and you just lied about the whole thing. Right here and right now, you're touching me, and that makes you an insider. I don't care if the crowd thinks you're public enemy number one. I don't care if all the religious high and mighties in the world think that you're the, the worst, secular, sinful, fleshy bug on the planet. You're touching me. You're moving towards me. You're following me, and that makes you an insider. That is the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says to this lying rule breaker, you are my daughter, you're an insider. And see, in the kingdom, it just doesn't matter what you have done. You're moving towards Jesus. And wherever you are, wherever you are whatever your position is, you're, it's the direction that defines you in the kingdom. And you're moving towards Jesus, and that makes you an insider. It really doesn't matter how many pills you've popped or how you struggle with that now. You're moving towards Jesus. You're an insider doesn't matter uh, how many people you've defiled along the way. doesn't matter how much prison time you served. I just don't care how many people you've ripped off, how many cars you've stolen, 
Uh, how many people you've had sex with? How many abortions have you had? How many divorces have you gone through? How many people have you hated? How many people have hated you? It just doesn't matter. What matters is you're moving towards Jesus. That makes you an insider. The direction, the direction of your life defines you inside the dome in which God is king. And if we grasp this, it is as radical and as non-religious and as beautiful as you could possibly imagine. It's more beautiful than that. The kingdom of God looks like this. Jesus is walking along the hillside of Galilee, and there's 500 people uh, behind him from all walks of life and all different stations of life, all these different characteristics. And Jesus stops and turns around and says, Behold the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom of God. You're following Jesus. You may have a lot of different ideas and a lot of different issues and a lot of different struggles and a lot, a lot, a lot of other things, but it's the direction you're headed that defines you as being inside the domain of God's reign. And no one in the crowd is doing background checks on people. (laughs) No one is administrating pre-qualification tests. Hmm? No one's asking, are you worthy to be following him? Uh, No one's sizing each other up. No one's checking each other out. No one's getting life from contrasting themselves with one another. They're all just heading in the same direction, following Jesus, so that you put your arm around the other person and you say, walk with me. And that's all that matters. That is the kingdom of God. What it means, folks, is this. The kingdom of God is the one community on the planet that is not to be defined by who we exclude because we don't exclude anybody. It's to be defined by the one who includes all. The kingdom of God is to be the one community that's not defined by the parameter. So you don't need police patrolling the parameter, who's inside and who's outside. The kingdom of God is to be defined by the center, and the center is Jesus Christ. And if you're moving in that direction, then you're inside of the kingdom. I've read sociologists who say that that is impossible. You can never have a social group unless you have clear parameters about who's inside, who's outside, what the qualifications are. In fact, there are some who say you can't possibly have a a human society unless you have clearly defined human enemies to to reinforce the us-them kind of thing. That's why this fallen structure of society results in violence so often. But we kingdom people are here to prove the sociologists wrong. We are defined not by who we're against, but by who we're for and who we're moving towards. And we're moving towards Jesus, and we're for everybody. Amen? In Jesus' name. Here's a diagram. A diagram of fallen human culture. It's just like this. There's an us inside, and there's a them that's outside. And there's a clear wall separating the two. And there's polarity there. Us versus them. We the righteous versus the unrighteous, or whatever group you happen to be a part of. But here's what the kingdom of God looks like. There's no parameter. There's just a movement. And Jesus is in the center. And we're moving towards Jesus. We're pressing through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. We know we have a need. That means that we're inside the kingdom. We know who can meet that need. That that means we're inside of the kingdom. And what about those who aren't following, who aren't moving towards Jesus? Even there, we don't draw a parameter. Oh, they're on the outside and we're on the inside. Uh, For all we know, they're moving towards Jesus more than we are. We're not in a position to judge that. Even towards those who don't seem like they're moving towards Jesus, our job, Jesus says, is just to love them. Even if they think they're our enemies, our job is just to love them. We bless them. We know that God's working in their life just like he's working in, in our life. We know that God is, 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 is pulling them. So we just love them and bless them and invite them to walk with us. And we don't get life from contrasting ourselves with them because we don't get life by contrasting ourselves with anybody. We get life from Jesus Christ, and he's the one that we're moving towards. And that, folks, is the kingdom of God. That, folks, is the kingdom of God. If you are moving towards Jesus, you are an insider. Accept that. Accept that acceptability. He calls you daughter. He calls you son. Accept that acceptability. You are acceptable in Christ because you know your need and you're reaching out towards him. Now, some people may have trouble with that because you, you, you have a, what I might call a spirit of rejection. You've been rejected so much. You've always been on the outside. You feel like an alien in every social group. I want you to see that the kingdom of God is unlike every other social group. You, may, you, you maybe didn't make the cut with the popular crowd. You maybe you know, didn't make the cut with a pretty crowd, and you never got invited to the cool parties. But if you're moving towards Jesus, you're part of the kingdom crowd. You're part of the Jesus crowd, and that's the crowd that's going to last forever. All right? Know that you are an insider. No ifs, ands, or buts. A lot of us just don't cut the grade with a lot of other social groups. Maybe you never made the upper class. You're not part of the upper class. You're, you're not part of one of the haves. You're the have-not. You're not part of decent society. You're not, you're not uh, part of the educated crowd. 
And maybe you're one of those people who never quite got on the inside of the white-dominated privilege structure. So you've been to restaurants where you know that you're not really welcome there, and you've been to car dealers where you know that you're not really welcome there. And, and it may be the case that in this fallen world, you don't even have a hope of ever owning your own house. And we should do all we can to change that in society. But in the meantime, i got a word for you. You may never own a house because of the fallen structure of this world, but you got a mansion in glory. <laughs> All right, that's coming. All right. And there may be places in this demonically oppressed world that won't serve you dinner, but someday you're going to sit down on the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's going to be a feast. You're an insider on the kingdom of God. You're an insider on the kingdom of God. It may be the case that you've never cut up, cut, cut, made the cut with the religious crowd. You know, you still feel comfortable around religious people. I, I understand that very, very well. Maybe you, maybe you bleed in ways that religious people tag you as being unclean. Their way of bleeding, that's okay. That, you know, but your way of bleeding, your way of being wounded or the struggles that you've got or the past that you've got or whatever, they tag that as being unclean. And so you've been an outsider in religious circles. But the good news is this. The kingdom of God is not religious. <laughs> uh, there's no religious prequalification. And you're an insider on the kingdom of God. If you just know your need and reach out to touch him, doesn't matter even how close you are, you're moving in that direction. And that means you're an insider on the kingdom of God. And if you keep on doing that, just keep walking in that direction. It's just a matter of time before you get whole. It's just a matter of time before you begin to get free. But getting whole and getting free isn't the precondition for following him. Following him and pressing towards him is the precondition for getting whole and getting free. And sadly, I'll, I'll be out loud about this, you may have to press through a lot of people to get to Jesus. You may have to press through a religious crowd to get to Jesus. Sometimes the biggest obstacle to Jesus are religious people. Sometimes the biggest obstacle to Jesus are churches. And you may have to work through a lot of their garbage they dump on you. I encourage you to separate Jesus from all of that and just know that he sees you, whatever the bleeding issue is, he sees you as inside the kingdom. My word is this. Are you moving towards Jesus? And if you are, accept that insider status. You are as inside as Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or anybody else. Because it doesn't matter where you are. What matters is the direction you're headed. And if you don't, if you're not one of those who are intentionally following Jesus, pressing towards Jesus, moving in his direction, I encourage you to do that. Make that commitment here this morning. I suspect you actually already are, otherwise you wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, you're, probably, you're probably more on the inside than you think. But make, it, make a commitment. After this service, just kind of come on up here and talk to some folks who will be up here and, 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 and surrender your life to Jesus and become an insider of the kingdom of God. The word to all of us is this, wherever we're at. We all are just walking along the hillside of Galilee and look at a, a crowd is following Jesus. That's what we're all doing here. And that means we're all insiders, and that means we all have to treat each other as insiders. We all have to go out of our way to reaffirm for each other that we are insiders. Uh, that's easy for some, but it's hard for others. There are some here, praise God, a lot of people here who have a, a, a mistrust for organized religion or a mistrust of churches, and some of it for very legitimate reasons. There are, are people here who have a, a, special, a, a special mistrust for a church with white leadership and a predominantly white church for legitimate reasons. You've been burned in the past. The job of all of us, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Latino, Native American, Asian, whatever, the job of all of us is to take it upon ourselves, the kingdom task, to reaffirm for every other person we come in contact with, no ifs, ands, or buts, that they are insiders. They are, they are reaching out to touch Jesus. They are embraced by the love of God. You don't have to know a thing about them. To know that is true. Our one job is to agree with God that they were with Jesus dying for and to express that by how we talk to them, how we think about them, and how we relate to them. Unless a person invites you in on their life and asks you to have a comment or give input on the various issues of their life, unless that happens, and we all need that kind of intimate community, but unless that happens, you don't need to know and or notice another thing about them. Uh, you, all you know is that they're here right now and they're walking in this direction and, and you're happy that they're here. Uh, it doesn't matter what you see. I don't care how many or what kind of tattoos they have over them. A lady came to me uh, several uh, months ago, I guess it was, 
Uh, and she was very concerned. She goes, there's a person here at church, and he had satanic tattoos up and down his arms, just vile things and naked ladies and 666 and other things. And she was really concerned. And my, my response was, praise God! That's wonderful! Wonderful! You know, he's here. He's joining the crowd to this degree. He's getting caught up in this movement. That, I, I, that's what we ought to be seeing as the kingdom is being birthed. Uh, you know, it, I, it doesn't matter what slogan they have on their shirt. Uh, there's some people with interesting slogans here. I, I, I think sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, a person may be doing that intentionally uh, just to, to, to test you. Uh, I, am I welcome here? Are you going to be offended by this? Uh, you know, in a lot of places, maybe we'd disinvite them. They'd communicate to them that you're not welcome here, not with that shirt, not with that slogan. Our job as kingdom people is to, who cares about that? They're here. That's what matters. Uh, and, and, and we put our arm around them and walk with them. You just love them in the kingdom. It doesn't matter whose hand they're holding or what color their hair is, and I don't care what is pierced. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't care what you see. Look beyond it. And agree with God, the one thing that we're supposed to agree with is that they, this person has unsurpassable worth. And they're here, and they're moving in a certain direction. So you treat all people equally as kings and queens because they're part of royalty. They're on the inside of the kingdom. Amen? In Jesus' name. That, folks, is the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom of God. Amen. That is the kingdom of God. And it's beautiful. It is an anti-inside-outside revolution. That's what's going on in this world. Close your eyes for a moment. Holy Spirit, will you communicate to us what we are supposed to individually take away from this message? Holy Spirit, just seal the message in our heart. You may be here and you have not deliberately chosen to follow Jesus. He's pulling you, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I encourage you to make that decision this morning. Surrender your life to Jesus. It's not a pledge of perfection. It's just a pledge of a movement. You're going to be moving in his direction. Just do it right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me and pull me to, to you. And if you're praying that prayer, I want to encourage you at the end of this service to come up here and talk to our prayer team that will be up here, and they just love to talk with you and pray with you about that to get started on the walk with God. It may be that some here struggle with a spirit of rejection because you've never felt like an insider, certainly not in church, perhaps certainly not in a white-dominated church, you know, a church with a white senior pastor. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to minister to you and to see that the kingdom is a kingdom without walls and demarcations and you are an insider. Others maybe feel like an outsider because of things that they have done or things that have been done to them. I encourage you right now just to see yourself as that woman who broke all the rules, lied, defiled Jesus. But then Jesus says, calls her daughter and affirms her faith. Can you hear and see Jesus calling you son, calling you daughter? The fact that the rules were broken right now is not important. What matters is that you have faith in him. And receive that. You're an insider. You are an insider. And finally, Holy Spirit, help us to apply this to our life if it's needed. It's probably needed to some degree by all of us. Will you commit to cultivating a mindset that is capable of looking beyond the external, social, inside, outside, us, them distinctions and seeing people just as people, as creations of God and people who have unsurpassable worth because Jesus died for them. Can you co commit to, to walking with that mindset? Can you commit to collapsing all of your judgment mechanisms that separate you from others and contrast people and devalues others? Can you commit to striving to see the world and to see people the way God sees the world and the way God sees people? Holy Spirit, Tear down strongholds of judgment right now. Stories that we've told ourselves about other people who look a certain way and act a certain way and wear certain kinds of t-shirt or hold certain people's hands. Lord, collapse those judgment mechanisms and free us to be the outrageous, radical lovers that you were, that you are. Hmm. As we leave this place, Lord God, let your spirit rest upon us. We pray ahead of time for all those who are going to be baptized. Make it a 
precious kingdom moment, Lord God. Holy Spirit, just show up there. Let it be a party. We pray for all the fellowship that's going to happen outside as people get their burgers and, and hang out. And Lord, as we go to our places of work or our homes or our neighborhoods, Lord, just let the beautiful aroma and inclusive aroma of Jesus and the kingdom radiate from us and use us to build your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Go out and build the kingdom.